Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word, Book of St. John. You know, we have a good example here in this fourth chapter of how Christ can use whomever he chooses. He knows the hearts of people, and he knows regardless of what your past is. It's what your present mindset and the future holds for you as to whether he can use you or not. But he had come up to this well, and a Samaritan woman questioned him, and, and she said, he said, it was not proper to talk to a woman without her husband or family there. He says, go get your husband. She said, I don't have one. He said, you said that rightly. You've been married five times, and the old boy you're living with now, you're not married to him. But did Christ go ahead and use her? You know, a lot of churches would say, she's a divorcee. She can't teach Sunday school. And I, I want you to take Christ's word at face value. Remember back in chapter 3 where it said God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever was not a divorcee could serve him? Well, that's not what it said, was it? It said whosoever believeth. And she believed. She had just gone into town after she realized he was Messiah. And she, she was so excited, she left even her belongings, which were hard to come by, at the well, and rushed into town, and Christ used her to, live, to deliver out of town the people. We're going to pick it up there when verse 30 is they're beginning to come to him. Verse 30 and chapter 4, the great book of St. John, a word of wisdom from her father. Let's go with it. Then they went out of the city and came unto him. They wanted to see this. 31, in the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. They'd gone, that's why they weren't there. They'd gone after some food. 32, but he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And being disciples, they should have known. Verse 33, therefore said the disciples one to another, have any man brought him off to eat? Did somebody slip him some food we don't know about? Verse 34, and Jesus said unto them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. That comes first. And to finish his work. To, it came to do it and to get it done. To put it away. Okay. That, that was his meat. That was his purpose. Verse 35. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look on the fields, for they are white, all ready to harvest. Now, I, I want you, how many... How many months does Antichrist have on earth before the harvest? The harvest is the end of this age. Well, he's got five. So what is, he, what is Christ telling us here? It would seem that in four months, we're going to be able to operate quite openly, freely, and get the job done. But um, that, and that is an answer that many people concerning the end times might wonder about. But because we, it is split into two, two and a half month periods. But um, we know here now that it is but four months to the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for the harvest is white al already. Already, that's when we go to work. That's when the blessings will begin to flow. And uh, Christ teaches in a way and on different depths do you have your eyes open. 36. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. That's the whole pro question. Is do you, not just in the flesh, 
but to live eternally. That both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. In other words, we're a family, a group, we're God's children, regardless of who you are. And when you plant seeds, they all come from who? From God. From our Father. And when we share equally, when, when this is like when, when you support a ministry, you become a part of it. Just as much as the teachers who teach, you receive your reward from the same as that teacher does because you're a part of it. One reaps, one sows. It's all the same. It all comes from God. 37. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. 38. I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestoweth no labor. You didn't work at it. Other men labored. They worked at it. And you are entered into their labors. Um, in other words, again, it's, it is God's children, God's family. And all things come from God. When God chooses a person, then certainly um, those that support him those that are with him, whether they sowed, they're going to reap. And it is written that all of God's elect will be delivered up before the false Messiah for a testimony so the whole world can hear the truth. You see, all that wisdom comes from our Father. And he drops us a nugget here that is fantastic and one you want to pay close attention to. Verse 39, to continue on back to the subject. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for saying of the, for, for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that ever I did. That testimony of the woman, God using her, brought many of these people out and caused them to be believers. Verse 40, so when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. <clears throat> and, uh, and so it is, right, right there to, to, what was he going to do? Plant meat. 41. And many more believed because of his own word. Now, it's important that you catch that. Did he perform some great miracle in front of them that caused them to believe like he did to the house of Israel? No. He didn't perform any miracle. They believed simply because of his word. They believed simply because of the truth. He didn't have to, and these were Samaritans that had kind of a bad reputation and were not all that well thought of. But they didn't need miracles to believe. Maybe drinking from Jacob's well and the knowledge of it being Jacob's well, the migrations and so forth, may have had a little to do with it, but I, don't, I think not. It was because they were starving for truth. People are all over the world to hear the word of God. It is that word, not miracles, that give you eternal life. So it is true God used the woman to, to um, take them, to, to bring them there. But once they were there, it was Christ's word that delivered them. 42, and they said unto the woman, now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the anointed one, Messiah, the Savior of the world. And they, they needed nothing more than the word itself. And, but Christ, uh, again, Christ chose to use that woman and a, a Unfortunately, a lot of churches would probably not even allow her in. And she's lucky because you wouldn't want to join a church like that anyway. 
Verse 43. Now after two days he departed thence and went into Galilee. We're going all the way back to the circuit again, back where the first miracle was performed. 44. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. And this is true. Your, your own family will have much trouble believing you compared to total strangers that do not know your habits and so forth, but hear the word. 45, then when he was come into Galilee, the Galileans received him. Having seen all the things that he did at Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went into the feast. That's way back in chapter 2, verse 23, where he went to Jerusalem and performed many miracles there. They saw the miracles. And is it not strange that the Samaritans didn't need the miracles? But his own neighbors uh, at Galilee, um, they had to see the miracles, and that tickled their fancy, <coughs> and they began to believe. 46. So Jesus came again unto Cana of Galilee. That's where he turned the water to wine, and the wedding took place. Where he made, then there it says it, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. That's the, the house of compassion. And a nobleman is one, and he's pretty high up on the totem pole here. Why is he going to be approaching Christ? Well, let's find out. When he heard, verse 47, when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea unto Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. His, his, this nobleman's son was dying. No one could help him. So he makes this trip. When he hears that Christ is there, he put out the effort to go. Verse 48, Then said Jesus unto him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. You see, Christ is making a point here. Now, he's testing the faith of this nobleman. Verse 49, the nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. In other words, he knew Christ could heal him. All the faith in the world right before his face. He did not need to see a miracle. He loved his son and he wanted his son to live. And, and so it was that uh, he documents he documents that, uh, that certainly that he has the faith. What did Jesus say then? Verse 50, Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken to him, and he went his way. He's got quite a ways to go. But he's not worried about it. Why? He believed. Verse 51, and as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. 52, and then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. Now, you know, here we have the, the seventh hour, seven is a sign of spiritual completeness. But also, it means the millennium age. That's the seventh dispensation of time. That's the millennium when many will be saved and many will be healed. Because they never had an opportunity to hear the real truth taught. And they will at that time. Christ doesn't have to, he, he didn't even have to be there. But belief in truth caused it to happen. And it happened exactly that way on that seventh hour. 
the time that Christ himself would appear even via the trumps. And certainly uh, the seventh hour of dispensation, the millennium, and the very seven itself being spiritual completeness. So it was instant, just like that, Father touched. Now, verse uh, 53, to continue, and it reads, So the Father knew that it was at the same hour into which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed and his whole house. They, they, they believed on the word of God. 54, this is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea unto Galilee. The second is like two witnesses he gives, and, and certainly we see the second advent as well on, with the number seven, that um, the, um, the, the very time itself, the five months, the four months, the seventh dispensation of time, there's a great deal written into that chapter that we can learn from with Christ letting his election know that if you believe that he's still on the throne and he's well in control and he will witness if you will listen. Chapter 5, verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. It is, there's much consternation between scholars as to what day this is. I feel it was Purim. It was not a, a holiday or a feast day set aside by God, but by the children of Judea themselves, called Purim. Verse 2, Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, which, which means the house of mercy, having five porches, uh, and there was an intermittent stream there. It would flow at times, and at times it wouldn't. The fairy tale was that if you have an illness, and you're the first one in the water when it begins to flow in this intermittent stream, you'll be healed. There'll be angels there, and they will heal you. Naturally, that's not true. But it was a a custom that man had derived, certainly not with the blessings of God, that is to say. Verse 3. In these, in these um, uh, lay a great multitude of impotent folk. They were sick. Of blind, halt, that's uh, crippled, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. Just waiting, it's going to move. We'll have a miracle. If you want a miracle, look to God, not some water. If you want to partake of the living water, that's one thing. But don't get wrapped up in men's fairy tales. Verse 4. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. D do you think, well, that's right there in the Bible. I read it myself. Yeah, but it's men saying, not God's. Okay. You have to learn to determine and discern truth. Verse 5. And a certain man was there which had an infirmity, 38 years. Now think about that. He had this illness for 38 years. Verse 6. Then Jesus, when Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time, in this case, 38 years, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Christ just asked him a direct question. Bear in mind, there's, there's a lot of people 
with illnesses waiting for that water. And do you know something? The living water was standing right there in front of them that could do something. Verse 7, the impotent man answered him, Sir, I, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. I have to have somebody carry me there. But while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. I never can make it down to be the first one. Verse 8. Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. Now, this will be interesting. Um, will he still want to go down into the water? Or will he be a believer enough that he's going to pick up his bed and walk with it? Heal. Verse 9. And immediately the man was made whole, and he took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Now this is trouble. You know, the man's you got to watch man's traditions. You know what man says? You can't carry your bed on the Sabbath. Well, you know, um, God made the Sabbath for man, and Christ became our Sabbath. And inasmuch as Christ is the highest Sabbath of all, even our Passover, as it is written in Second Corinthians, uh, First Corinthians, rather, five verses seven and eight, then if Christ said, "Pick up your bed and walk," I don't care what day of the week it is, pick up your bed and walk. It's legal, because the king said to do it. That making it legal, regardless of what some uh, silly men saying might say, you know. Uh, priests and teachers always, I don't care what day you call the Sabbath, they have to work on the Sabbath. So there is work on the Sabbath, and the better the day, the better the deed. So um, you, you want to be very careful when you allow man's law and traditions. That's why I think Purim was picked to start this chapter. God didn't bring Purim to pass. Man did. Uh, and God didn't bring this story forward that every time that intermittent stream runs that you'll be healed. They weren't. So beware of man's traditions. They will take you under. Well, how could I do that? Right here with the good old Word of God. The Word of God will help you believe. The word of God will see you through. So, but inasmuch as he said that, there will be trouble. Let's see what it is. Verse 10 to continue. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. Is it not, it is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed? Verse 11. He answered them, he that made me whole, the same said unto me, take up thy bed and walk. And you know, when the king says it, it's legal. Verse 12, then asked they him, what man is that which said unto thee, take up thy bed and walk? What, what, what man said such a thing to you? Now, don't you know, how would you like to be in the shoes of this one? Who's he going to listen to? These corruptors who, when he lay down on the ground on his pallet, and people run over him to get into that water, and nobody was healed, or do you think he's going to listen to that one that stepped forward and said, take up your bed and walk? Who do you think he's going to side with? Put yourself in his shoes. He's whole. And naturally, he knows that comes from God. Verse 13, and he that was healed wished not who it was. He didn't know. For Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. This, this term conveyed is a term that means he turned his head to avoid blows. 
Okay, so he, he got out of there before there was trouble. Uh, verse 14, not that he couldn't have handled it. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple, and he said unto him, Behold, thou art, uh, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon thee. And, and that's, that's what can happen if you cleanse a house and then let it get foggy again. 15, and the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. He's, he's the one. 16, and therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him. What a nice religious group, huh? What, what a fine church to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. In other words, breaking the traditions of men, not the traditions of God. 17, but Jesus answered them, my father worketh hitherto and I work. Hitherto in the Greek means we work constantly. We don't take any time off. We, we, the Father and myself, we work constantly. This is why I told you earlier that even on the Sabbath, the priests or teachers or, uh, and church people, they work. That's what, that's what their duties are. They do it constantly teaching God's word that it goes out, that it rains down supreme, that people hear that word, and that word will make you whole. And that word will separate you from the traditions of men that make void the word of God and bring you into the true path whereby you move forward by the grace of the living God. Okay. We, we, I don't care what time of the day it is, what time of the year or anything else. My father and I, we get it done. We continuously seek. Verse 18. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him. Real religious people, huh? Because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Oh, how could he? Because he was, that's why. Now, um, naturally, we know that many Kenites had slipped into this organization by this time. And we can't blame our brother Judah on this. It was those very children of Satan, the Kenites, that would instill in the minds of people, kill him, kill him, kill him. And when a mob gets going, breaking their traditions, they can sure get stuffy. They can sure get self-righteous to where they don't know, come here from Sikkim, that means right from wrong. But uh, they, they wanted to destroy him. Verse 19, then answered Jesus and he said unto them, verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Well, they're one and the same. Emmanuel, God with us. Verse 20. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these that he may marvel. And those greater works that he does are the marvelous works of Almighty God. How precious it is. Uh, 21, and as the Father raised up the dead and quickened them, made them alive, even so the Son quickeneth or makes alive whom he will. Well, I will do it my way. I'm sure this won't make many points because he wasn't cutting any slack for them. And um, it will bring some to believe. And those that believe will have that life, will be quickened from spiritually dead to inheriting eternal peace with the Father. Verse 22. 
For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. This is why they, um, they kind of stick their neck out. Because whether they realize it or not, the one that stands before them will judge them. Even at the final judgment, he will be, have a part in it. So that makes it pretty conclusive. And how will he judge people trying to kill him when he's doing the Father's work? Well, uh, I think that's pretty obvious, is it not? When they have had an opportunity to know the truth. 20, next verse, please, 23. That all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. And, and I'm sure this is, this is causing some, some eyebrows to raise among these people because they're going to call it blasphemy in their own hearts. One more verse, 24. Verily, verily, truly, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth, not part way, believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. And here's the judge telling you that if you, if you believe the word, and you know something, it is not that you would follow blindly for the word verifies itself. The word never changes. And if you're a student of that word, you know from day one, the creation, even the first earth age, things always come down exactly as God has written them. So the word documents itself, proves itself. Do you know something? It gives life. I'm not talking about just living. I'm talking about life eternal. He who judges in this realm you just heard him say it. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are. Back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Once you do that, and uh, let it be from our Heavenly Father. Now, uh, his word, that is to say. Never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We will not judge people. We have one judge, and he likes to do the judging, and he likes for us to stay out of that part. You have the right for spiritual discernment to know who to listen to and who not to. That is your prerogative. But uh, our Father wants to be the judge. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end, at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Always a pleasure. Got a prayer request? Don't need the number or an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking right now. He does. Why? You're his child. He created you different than anyone else. He has duties for you. He will talk to you. He will lead you if you listen through the word. And uh, let him know that you love him. Once you do that, Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, 
touch in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. Okay, question time. We're going to go with um, Angela from Rhode Island. What did Jesus mean when he said, let the dead bury the dead? Did he mean let the spiritually dead bury the spiritually dead, those who do not follow the Lord? No, he, he meant uh, the young man wanted to follow him, but his, his father was in the transition of dying. It could have taken a year. And what Christ was saying is, let the family be, let the family see him through the illness. God's word comes first. If you want to follow me, you got to do it now. And it was not an insult to the father. Um, this would be. This is um, Stacy from Arkansas. My question, the church I was attending judged me because of my jewelry. I find no scripture in the Bible to support this. Could you please uh, uh, help me with this? Well, you know, we do all things in moderation. The reason the word talks about fancy jewelry and makeup, it was talking about the purple makeup and so forth that harlots wore, which to, would say they were available. In other words, it, the paint marked them as harlots. And, and certainly, makeup in moderation, you, you're certainly not advertising that by any means or stretch of the imagination. But unfortunately, some people uh, take a little bit of truth here and put their own traditions and go with it. and. It hurts people. I'm sorry they did that to you. Don't let that waver your love and serving of God. Ricky from Pennsylvania. Pastor, judgment begins at the pulpit. When a preacher teaches something that is not according to Father's word, him being wrong in his teaching, does this mean that his congregation would uh, not be found guilty of, of his way of teaching? No, they would... They would still answer for it, but he would answer for it more so because that's where judgment starts. If you teach falsely and mislead some people, you're going to have to answer for it. This is why if you set yourself up, or you, God kind of appoints teachers. And when he appoints you, you better do your homework. And you better do it right, because you will answer for it. Kathy from California. The Antichrist comes at the sixth trump. What actually is a trump? Is it a literal trumpet, or how will we know? It is a sequence of events from one through seven, that when you read the trumps and see those events of that certain trump come to pass, you know it has sounded, okay? Tracy from Georgia. What is the purpose of speaking in tongues? Did we speak in tongues? so that God hears us and so that the devil does not. No, no, no. What, what is man's overall purpose in the word is to teach it, to share it. Just as we in today's lesson, some sow and some reap. The idea is to get the word across. The, listen to me and check it out for yourself. When you see unknown tongue, utilized in the manuscript, the Bible, that word in the Greek means a language you were not born with, meaning you have to learn a second language um, to speak that particular tongue. Now, the reason speaking in tongues, if you speak English, you can't take the word of God to Sidadi Miheko because they will not know what you're talking about unless you can speak Spanish. Therefore, you learn tongues or languages is what it actually translates, not tongues, but languages. You learn languages to further the word of God. It's that simple. The Pentecostal tongue, as you will learn in Acts chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, you won't find the word unknown connected with it because it was in 
everyone understood, even in the dialect of where they were born, whether they were Russian, Chinese, Japanese, or Hebrews, Greeks, or Aramaic uh, speakers. Donald from North Carolina. Where can I get something about the eighth day creation? Well, how about from God's word? Uh, you know, that's probably the best way. Do you know how you get to the eighth day? You count off seven, and the next one is the eighth. That's brilliant, isn't it? And I'm not talking down to you, but it's that simple. What did God do on the eighth day? Well, he rested the seventh, and then he realized he didn't have a farmer. So he, that's a husbandman. That means a farmer in the Hebrew tongue. So therefore, he created Eth Ha'adam, a different man than the six-day races, and made a, created him a wife out of, from the feminine DD, DNA, the curve, the helix, helix curve of their DNA, and created Eve, and uh, who is the mother of all living, because through her would come Christ, and you're either in him, or you're not living. Rodney from Missouri, in a program the other day, Pastor Murray was talking about the elect and the ethnos. Who, who are they? Well, the elect, uh, God chooses certain people. They know the false Christ comes first. They love his word and they study it, and God uses them. The ethnos simply, it means nations or Gentiles. Okay? It means other peoples. They can be Christians and be used just as well. Uh, Katie from Texas, how can I look up the word Cajun? I can't find it anywhere. Take your Strong's Concordance and go to the Hebrew Dictionary, and the word will be 7014. Uh, and it's, um, it can be either K-A-G-I-N or K-A-J-I-N, Cajun or Cajun. The same, it is the same in the Hebrew. It's Cain, the first child. Uh, Elizabeth from, Elizabeth is from California. Please explain Exodus 34, 12. I just don't understand it. Well, you, be careful who you make a contract with. Be, it's as simple as make sure if you're traveling and there's a stranger there and you try to spike a bargain, or, or make an agreement with them. You don't know them. You don't know whether they'll keep their word or whether they might set a trap for you to talk you into a contract or a covenant that you will not be wanting to keep. So all he's saying is, is um, don't make contracts with strangers that you know nothing about. Uh, Lorna from California. We are followers of your Bible lessons currently listening, okay? A quick question and answer to a question um, uh, that Satan was never in a flesh body nor will ever be, then I understand. What puzzles me is that if he is a spiritual being, how was he able to impregnate Eve, whom you teach was wholly seduced? I understand that the covering was big leaves and the genitals that indicates a sexual act between Eve, Adam, and Satan. However, but Satan is as a spiritual... Well, wait, wait just a minute. You're, you're taking on too much on yourself. Who was Adam created in the image of? Of God and the angels, meaning of himself. Exactly. The body, the male body was exactly the same as the angelic body. One was flesh, the other was spiritual, but they were the exact same. People partook of angels' food because it sustained them. It was called manna. What would sustain the spiritual body would sustain the flesh body. So uh, wh what about the fallen angels? They certainly weren't in the flesh. That's why when they intermix with the daughters of Adam in chapter 6 of Genesis, there were hybrids. In other words, they were, they were giants, Gibra. It was not God's way. Okay, this would be Mary from North Carolina. We've been studying with you and can clearly see you do not believe in the rapture of the church. No, I don't. 
Can you clearly explain then what is meant in First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses uh, 13 through 18? Paul is discussing the comfort of Christ's coming. Uh, and he says in verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend. Well, now, wait a minute. You see, you're making a big mistake in what you say here. You, you say 13, all right, well enough, and, but yet you read 16. Uh, what happens in 13? It sets the stage for what's going to be taught, the subject matter. And until you know the subject matter of something, you're ignorant. You don't know, if you don't know what the subject matter is, you don't know what you're talking about. Let's go back to 13. Let's pick it up there instead of where you pick it up here at 16. And let's see plainly what it says. Do you believe the word of God or do you believe some uh, teacher? Let's see what the word of God has to say about it. Verse 13, chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning what? Concerning them which are asleep that you sorrow not. You don't have to feel sorry for the dead people, even as others which have no hope. In other words, don't, don't, they're, they're not out here in some hole in the ground. Why? He tells you in 14, and you pass those. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and you would or you wouldn't be a Christian, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Why? They've already risen. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. <clears throat> For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. By what? By the word of the Lord. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will not prevent them which are asleep. Why? Well, it's really quite simple. Don't be ignorant about it. They're already gone. They're with him. God is the God of living, not the dead. He doesn't leave them out here in some hole in the ground. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God the seventh. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Colon. Why? Because they're already there, and he'll bring them back with him. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together, and we will be changed into spiritual bodies at that time. Don't be ignorant of God's word. The danger in teaching there is a rapture and all Christians are going to be gone, they are not taught that the Antichrist comes first. And when the Antichrist shows up first, his message will be, get in my wagon and let's go. They're going to think he is Christ. And it would be awful easy to be a Satan worshiper if you were ignorant of verse 13 and 14 in the chapter you're quoting from. Uh, Cindy from Georgia, can you give me scripture on all children go to heaven when they die? And if they drowned at two years old age, that they died a premature death because they drowned due to mankind's negligence or what? Neg negligence? Or was it his time to go? Well, th things happen. If you read Luke chapter 13, 18 died at the Tower of Siloam because they were sinners? No, because the tower fell on them. Stuff happens. But all children are innocent. And naturally, that's why it's easy to say. But, uh, but even what, what you must understand, you read Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. I don't care who you are. When the flesh dies, you go to paradise, one side or the other. You may be on the wrong side, but you're there for the great judgment will come. But little children are innocent, and they do go to heaven on the right side of the gulf. Lynn from Missouri. My question is in Revelation chapter 7. I understand there will be 144,000 of God's elect sealed to be protected during this time. Is that all out of all the billions of people on earth? It seems such a small number. No, it is not. They are teachers that will be utilized as you will continue reading in Revelation chapter 14. But well, did you go 
Go on then and read chapter 7, verse 9. What, do, what does it say there after the, after the 144,000 are sealed? What does it say in, in that um, ninth verse? And um, it, it says in that ninth verse, you can't even count those that have on white robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. There are multitudes, thousands and thousands and thousands what, that were saved, that found salvation because of the teaching of the teachers and the leading of Almighty God. Okay? So um, on, only God's elect are sealed so they're not deceived by Satan. That's what it meant. Don't let the end come until their brain is set with God's truth so that Satan can't deceive them. Esther from, uh, where is Esther from? It looks, um, I, I can't, it looks like it's a chapter, I bet it's California, okay. My, uh, my son is in heaven, he loved the Lord God, he died at the age of 57, I know he is with God, can he look down and see me or his wife, he, he knows God, God allows certain times and things he knows. Would, um, he tried before. I told my son once if he died before me to put in a good word for me with God. Will God forgive me for that? No, there's, you don't. There, that does not deserve any forgiveness. That's well and good. I want you to make a home assignment of, of Matthew chapter 18, verse 10. Read it carefully, and you won't ever say you need to be forgiven. My question, this would be Dennis from Kansas. My question is, when we go to paradise, and the ones on the wrong side can see the ones on the right side, why can't the ones on the right see the ones on the left? If they can't, would this be held either way? No, they can see them. It, the paradise is, is a wonderful place. And that's one of the reasons that they're in hell in their own minds because they didn't make it. But in the millennium, there, there will be the second death. The soul does not die in paradise. The soul does not die until the end of the millennium. It is called the second death, and you can read of it in Revelation chapter 20. If they refuse to understand God's word through the millennium with, without flaw, then they, they will have an opportunity to, in a second resurrection that's also written in Revelation 20. Okay, this is Jan from California. Why do you, why do you not tell viewers that the Native Americans were there, there already, there when the Americans uh, arrived. Uh, I have a problem with you when you always say the Caucasians founded and settled the Americas. Now, you, you didn't hear me say that. You heard me say that the Caucasians went over the Caucasus Mountain, were called Caucasians, and um, migrated to Europe then later migrating to Canada and the Americas. We do many documentaries with the Native Americans of the, uh, and give them full credit in the documentaries, whether it would be the Trail of Tears, whether it would be the Cherokee, whether it would be the Navajo, or uh, we have done many documentaries on different people, uh, different uh, American Natives, and we love them and support them. Uh, Sue from Wisconsin, so does, I always thought that all sinners, the ones that are doomed, will go to the fire and burn forever and ever, no relief or burning. You say they will just dissipate and will go up in smoke as the fat, that's, you see, that's Psalms 37, okay, that's God telling you that. So does that mean people that go to hell are just erased and do not burn forever and ever? Well, what, what, what does it say in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 and 19, that happens to Satan? I mean, he's the meanest of all, king of Tyrus. 
that's the false rock, that he's turned to ashes from within. When, when God blots something out, it's gone. And the hell is that they never make it. Now, if you read the regeneration, or a better translated rejuvenation of this world, to put it back in its original place, in Revelation 21, there's not one tear, there's no one crying, there's no one unhappy. Now tell me this, the lake of fire in Revelation 20 is right there. What happened to it? I'm sure if it was still there and old Uncle Ned was out there hotter than a firecracker, I mean sizzling like a piece of bacon, I might shed a tear, but he's gone. There is nothing there that offends. So figure that one out and then praise God that he's a merciful father. What does it mean when you're brought it out? I don't know, I'll draw you a line and brought it out and see what happens to it. I'm out of time, okay? I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word. Most of all, God loves you for studying the letter that he has sent to you. It, it makes his day. And when you make God's day, boy, is he going to make yours. You can count on it. Now, we, we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If, if we have helped you, and only if we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. Most important, though, you know what's the most important thing? You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. Doesn't matter. It's still a good day. Why? Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you. John, three letters written by the Apostle John, that disciple whom Jesus loved. The tenderness of John's writings is marked by the number of times he begins the exhortations and warnings with, my little children, or little children. In fact, little children is written seven times in the first epistle alone. The contents of the first epistle are practical teaching in the light of the love of God. God is life, is light, is truth, is righteous, is love and we have fellowship with him through the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. The tenderness and love of John's writing continues in the second epistle as he encourages the elect lady and her children to love one another. He also writes, this is love, that we walk after his commandments. After these words of encouragement, John warns us that there are many deceivers entered into the world and explains how to identify these deceivers. Don't miss this opportunity to study the epistles of John with Pastor Arnold Murray.
From Gravit, Arkansas, this is Shepherd's Chapel with Pastor Arnold Murray. Join with us now as Pastor Murray takes you on a book by book, chapter by chapter, line by line, study in God's Word. Now, here's Pastor Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Hey, welcome to this family Bible study hour. Our Father's Word is so good to us. I want to talk today about the latter rain. Why do I want to talk about the latter rain? As a teacher, I want you to understand that many times idioms, figures of speech, and things that are connected with nature itself say a great deal more than is written on the page of the Word. And your father, if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, expects you to recognize these idioms or figures of speech 